We are live. Hello, Jesse, Dave, Aunt Melissa. Come on in. Today, we're going to talk about the stoned ape hypothesis. And I am John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, the obnoxious, adorable, deplorable. Welcome. For those who just joined, do you know what the stoned ape hypothesis is? Mark, Mac, 06, do you know what the stoned ape hypothesis is? Have you heard of the stoned ape hypothesis? I had never heard of it before until, so again, this is me I'm watching a lot of Joe, Joe Rogan lately. So stoned ape hypothesis, I saw, I had, and I'm, I'm a biologist, and I had never heard this hypothesis before. So stoned ape hypothesis is a hypothesis, a theory, that tries to explain how the human brain basically expanded. So when, hum when our human ancestors were in Africa, if you look at the fossils, there's like a period where the brains like suddenly expand. The brains like all of a sudden get way bigger. Now, I'm not, I'm not a human evolutionist, so I don't know like this particular species to give you and to say, well, this particular species, it was the transition from this particular species to that particular species where the brain expansion occurred. I can't tell you that, but I know the general idea. The idea is that there was a transition in human evolution. Are you trying to have a tea party? No, no tea party, it's no tea. I have water. So there's, a, so there's a transition where the brain size expands. And the Stone's Ape Hypothesis is a hypothesis for a mechanism that tries to explain how the, how the brains expanded. Okay, so this is a hypothesis from the person who originally thought of this is Terrence McKenna. And I bought his book and I read about half of his book now, about halfway through his book called Food of the Gods, where he outlines this hypothesis. So the essential premise of the hypothesis is that drugs were the initial impetus. So like hallucinogenic drugs were the impetus that caused the early human brains to expand long ago in Africa. That drugs were, the, that, drugs were that cause. That's the stone day hypothesis. So let me elaborate more on Terence McKenna's hypothesis. So he specifically relates this to mushrooms. So hallucinogenic mushrooms, these are psilocybin mushrooms. So psilocybin mushrooms have hallucinogenic compounds in them that cause humans to essentially hallucinate. Okay, and there's a, supposedly what happens is you take these mushrooms and there's a part of your brain that like, part of your, part of your brain is supposed to be like filter inform a filter of information. You only your brain can only think about one thing at the same, at one thing at once. And you can imagine all around you you're constantly bombarded with stimuli. So your brain needs to figure out a way to filter all these stimuli that are coming in around you in the most efficient manner to keep you alive. That's the only thing your brain cares about is keeping you alive. So there's this filter Okay, and these hallucinogenic compounds, when you take these psilocybin mushrooms, filter these nuts, these hallucinogenic compounds shut off that filter. And all of a sudden your brain starts making connections and thinking and interpreting stimuli in ways that the filter would not allow you to interpret it before. Okay, so that's like the effect of these psilocybin mushrooms. Now the stone day hypothesis is you find these mushrooms, these very, very specific mushrooms, only grow out of basically like ungulate shit. So ungulates are hooved animals, okay? So like cows, like ox, things ancestrally that we would be hunting in the African savanna. And these mushrooms grow out of ungulate shit, okay? So the hypothesis, so when an animal takes a shit, and you track the animal, you locate the shit, 
And if you're lucky, there's some hallucinogenic mushrooms growing out of the shit that you, that you find, okay? And the crazy thing is supposedly the effects, and people have actually studied these, the effects of these mushrooms, okay? This has been studied. If you take micro dose samples of these mushrooms, so you just see a little bit, it actually like enhances your visual acuity. So there's a thought, there's a thought that taking these mushrooms actually enhance your abilities to hunt animals, okay? So again, so the stone ape hypothesis is that we, as ancient, ancient humans in Africa, we're hunting animals and in the, in the animal shit that we encounter, there are these hallucinogenic mushrooms and we find them and we take them and they eventually cause our brains to like expand. That is the stone ape hypothesis in, in a nutshell. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of talk about the elements of this hypothesis that I think are very attractive and possibly true. And I'm also gonna talk about the elements of this hypothesis that are like total bullshit. Okay. So what are the, what, it, what are the parts of it that are bullshit? So Terence McKenna in the book, Food of the Gods, he says specifically that if you think, okay, let me preface this. If you're thinking about evolution, the way that things evolve is they pick up mutations. Okay. So in your genetic code, which is the DNA, the blueprint that runs your cells. Okay. Your cells can pick up mutations and that can cause things to change. So the stone ape hypothesis, according to Terence McKenna, implies that these hallucinogenic mushrooms cause mutations in your DNA, which then later translate into like increased brains the next generation. That's probably BS. One of the reasons that that's probably bullshit is because it's very unlikely from you eating something that a mutation in your DNA would occur in your sperm. So that's the key point, is for anything to be inherited in biology, for anything to be passed along to the next generation, it has to occur in your sperm. Because the only thing you donate, the only thing you donate to your next generation is your sperm, okay? So one of the flaws, one of the flaws of the stone ape hypothesis is that you eating the mushrooms, Somebody eating the mushrooms, if they ever cause mutations in human ge genetic composition or human DNA, it's very unlikely that those mutations would occur in the testes, in the cells that make the sperm. Okay, it's very, very unlikely for that to happen. So that's one reason I think that this hypothesis is probably bullshit. That the, it's very unlikely that these mushrooms cause the dramatic expansion in the size of the human brain. Okay, but I do like the idea that potentially taking hallucinogenic compounds could promote new ways of thinking, which could lead to the propagation of new memes. So you might potentially, under the influence of these hallucinogenic drugs, think of a new tool, which then becomes useful and then is passed on as a meme in the culture of your society. So I do buy, here's the argument that I buy, is I do buy the other half of Terence McKenna's argument. His first half is that these hallucinogenic mushrooms cause the expansion of the human brain, which I disagree with. I've eaten mushrooms and all my kids are smarter than me. <laughs> you love made me lose my train of thought. Um, <clears throat> What was I saying? Oh, okay, there's two parts. The two parts of the stone ape hypothesis. The first half is that the mushrooms cause the expansion of the brain. I don't believe that for the reason I just said. But the second part of the the second part of the stone ape hypothesis is that humans actually have a symbiosis with these hallucinogenic fungi. Okay? That I potentially believe. So a symbiosis in biology is where you have two separate entities. And they both give something that contributes positively to the other one, okay? So that's a symbiosis. So classic, classic symbiotic examples are like termites. Termites have bacteria in their guts, and it's actually the bacteria in their guts that allow them to di digest 
wood, okay? So the only reason that termites can eat wood is because they have bacteria in their guts that, promote, that produce the cellulose enzymes that degrade the wood. So if you, were, if you were to generate a termite line that didn't have the symbionts, the bacterial symbionts, they would not be able to eat wood. So that's a classic example of symbiosis. So symbiosis is where you have two separate entities. One helps the other and the other helps the other. They're both symbiotic, okay? So I do potentially believe the argument that it's entirely possible that humans and fungi have a symbiotic relationship in that the fungi would provide hallucinogenic effects to the humans, which would cause the humans to like these plants, and then the humans would propagate these plants, which would be beneficial to the fungi, okay? So I buy that. So let's talk about that more. So, Hang on, my thing, my thing got unlit. Okay, are there any questions at this point? I'll take questions at this point before I continue further. I should also say, there are other hypotheses that explain the, the increase in brain mass in the ancient humans. One of these is in the book Sapiens by, I think his last name is Harari. I can't, I can't pronounce his last name. But in the Sapiens book, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly that the hypothesis is that it was just like an increase in nutrition. Like we had access to different fruits in the African savanna and the trees. And these fruits provided us increased nutrition and the increased nutrition was what provided an enhancement in the brains. And then that enhancement in the brains was then selected upon by sexual selection. So you would be able, if you were a woman in the ancient days, you were able to easily tell which humans were the most smart because those humans would be making up songs. It'd be creative, essentially. They'd be making up songs or they would be the best hunters or they would be like, it was, it's very easy for women to tell which men are smartest, okay? So essentially an alternative hypothesis to the stoned ape hypothesis is that there was just an increase in nutrition which allowed our brains to expand and then the expansion of those brains was further selected upon by sexual selection of females preferring males that were more creative. That's, the, that's what's written in Sapiens. That's Harari's hypothesis, if I'm, if I'm interpreting it correctly. I have, some, I have some funny comments here. One of the things is, well, one question is, why aren't our brains like continuously getting larger? Like today, why don't we see a trend toward people getting smarter and smarter and smarter or our brains getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And the only response to this is that today, you and me, none of us are under the selective pressure that ancient humans were under. So you can be dumb as a box of rocks today and you can still survive because everybody else will take care of you. And you can still pass on your genes because everybody else will take care of the dumbest people. So, so today there's no sexual, there's no selection put upon human beings. So today's conditions are completely different than long ago. So this is, that's sort of an answer to the question of why, are, why aren't our brains continuously just expanding? Why aren't we continuously getting smarter? Well, we're not under the selective pressures that we were. Yeah, exactly. Natural selection is not allowed to run its course. That's, that's definitely what's happening today. It's, just, it's not, it's a kind of, it's a funny thing to think about. If you've seen the movie Idiocracy, that, that's literally the premise of Idiocracy. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about more about this symbiosis. So one of the fascinating things, if you if you don't if you don't this is kind of what set it for me. This is this is what made me really believe that there there must be something here to this symbiotic relationship. So if the symbiotic relationship is real, you would expect to have fine evidence of humans eating these mushrooms thousands and thousands of years ago. If you could find evidence of that, and you can. So if you look at cave paintings, and I actually looked at the paintings. So these cave paintings are talked about in the Terence McKenna book. And I looked them up on Google, search mushroom cave paintings, okay? And you can see these crazy cave paintings. And in the cave paintings, you see these mushrooms, and you see a bunch of pictures of cows. 
So ancient humans, it's a fact that ancient humans knew there was a relationship between the cows that we were essentially growing to eat, and the cows that we were herding, and the mushrooms, okay? So humans were definitely taking these mushrooms at least 10,000 years ago while we were raising cattle, okay? So first of all, the relationship is ancient. This is probably one of the very, this is probably, so if you're thinking in terms of like synthetic drugs or drugs that you find naturally, the psilocybin mushrooms are definitely, I definitely believe the argument that this is a very, very ancient relationship between humans taking these hallucinogenic drugs because you see them in the cave paintings. That, that was really convincing for me. The relationship is ancient. That's one of the key points. The other, the other key point that shows you that the relationship is very, very ancient is that the psilocybin, which is the toxin in the psilocybin mushrooms that causes the hallucinogenic effects, that toxin is very, very weak in terms of toxicity. So a human eating the mushrooms can never die from overdosing on the mushrooms. So this is very, very different to newer drugs. So like if you think of like cocaine or even like caffeine and alcohol, alcohol is even much newer. Alcohol, alcohol, if you look at like a dose curve, alcohol is one of the most dangerous drugs. Far more dangerous, it's super addictive and it will kill you extremely fast in terms of dose. If you drink too much alcohol, you will literally die, okay? The opposite is true for the psilocybin in these mushrooms. So the psilocybin, the chemical compound in these mushrooms, has very, very weak toxicity. You could eat a mountain of these mushrooms and you'd still be alive, like it would not kill you. So the fact that our bodies have evolved to be able to digest this toxin properly without, essentially without any real negative long-term side effects, that is evidence of a very, very long ancient evolutionary relationship. When things are new, when things are new relationships, like in terms of like a new disease that just comes out, oftentimes that new disease is very virulent and it's very deadly. If a relationship is very, very ancient, the disease, if you're thinking about this in terms of disease, the pathogen of the disease has time to evolve and has time to weaken itself. And it actually doesn't want to kill you. It wants to be weak so that it can continue to propagate inside you so that you pass along. The drugs are the same way. Think about a mushroom. Think about a mushroom that kills a human. Is a human ever going to eat that mushroom again? No, it's never going to culture that mushroom. It's never going to pass it on if it kills a human. Okay. So there's a ad selective advantage for mushrooms to develop these effects without actually hurting the human, okay? So those are two points that demonstrate the ancientness of this relationship. One, you see them in cave paintings. Two, the toxicity is very, very, very weak in these mushrooms. Okay. Hang on, let me light this again. I'm talking so much that my cigar goes out. Okay, so we're talking about symbiosis of the psilocybin mushrooms. To prove that it's a symbiosis, you have to prove that both parties get something. Okay, so what does the mushroom get? What does the mushroom get out of the symbiosis? And here's how you could test if it was an actual symbiosis. So the mushrooms, I told you, they grow in shit. They grow out of shit. If you're a human and you eat these mushrooms, and you go out and you take a shit. If mushrooms later pop up from the pile of your shit, that is a benefit to the mushroom. That is a means that the mushroom can spread itself around. So that would be why the mushroom would be benefiting, is that you, the human, would be a means of moving it to a new location and putting its seeds in a new area. So, but this, I, I don't know if this is actually tested. I don't know if anybody has actually tested. You could find that out in San Francisco. <laughs> That's the best comment ever. Yes, so that is exactly my point that I'm saying is if we want to test this hypothesis, 
That's actually a testable experiment. Just eat a bunch of mushrooms, go outside and take a shit, and look later in the next coming months or the next coming years to see if in that same location, a bunch of mushrooms grow. And if they do, you've then proven that at least from the mushrooms perspective, it's a symbiotic relationship. You could find willing participants. Oh, I'm def you definitely could for this experiment. It's a good experiment. You could get a cool paper from this, a cool scientific paper, okay? Now the other part of symbiosis is the other party has to get something. That means the humans have to get something out of it, okay? And just getting like high, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's enough of a benefit to the human to apply like selective pressure on. Like it must, it must do something to the human that promotes its actual, that person who takes these drugs as survival. And like I said, if the humans that take these mushrooms, when you eat these mushrooms, they don't, they don't hurt you. They don't cause a lot of toxicity. You cannot overdose. And what everybody says about them is once you take them, you essentially become more creative because it shuts off this filter. And so for a very short period of time, what, maybe like four to eight hours, you become very, very, very creative. And all of a sudden you see new connections. You think of new ideas. You think of new thoughts. You think about things from a completely different perspective. And I definitely believe that it's entirely possible that that could be essentially what the humans are getting out of this relationship. That could be the part of it. What's the difference between LSD on the brain versus the mushrooms? So LSD is actually also a very, very, very safe drug. You can't really overdose on LSD. The effects are sort of essentially the same, where they're in a sense that they're both hallucinogens. Negative people can't have a bad experience. They're both, so what, what, what people, I forget the guy's name. There's a guy at Harvard who originally studied all the original hallucinogens. And essentially what he said is that hallucinogens are, sim are essentially mind amplifying effects. So whatever you're thinking about at the time that you take the drugs, they essentially amplify that thinking like a thousand fold. So people talk about bad trips. If you're in a very, very bad state of mind, you're depressed about stuff or you're afraid about stuff or you're paranoid and you take hallucinogens, they will essentially make that a thousand fold worse. Now the flip side is also true where if you're a very, very positive mindset, you're a very, very optimistic person and you're trying to think of like a creative solution to a problem and you take hallucinogens, they can essentially amplify your thinking on that and help you think of the solution. And there is proof of this. So Kerry Mullis, who invented PCR, was who won the Nobel Prize. So this is a biochemist who invented the reaction, the chemical reaction that all scientists use to amplify DNA. This is like if somebody's in a crime and they do and they and they do DNA sequencing. This uses PCR. This guy who invented this was actually a huge stoner who thought of it on hallucinogenic LSD, okay? So there is actual evidence of this in a sense that a Nobel Prize winner, his Nobel Prize winning idea was actually generated from hallucinogenic uh, drug take. That's a fact. And you can read his book, uh, Dancing Naked in the Minefields, which is, a, I just finished that book like three months ago. And it's kind of what got me interested in this hypothesis. Okay. The other thing that I'll point out is that every mushroom experience I've had positive. LSD one good, one so bad. I'm scared to take it again. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to condone or I guess say people should or should not take drugs, whatever. Um, I'm just talking about the but I've heard that experience what people have said is that um a lot of people who have said that they've taken these mushrooms all talk about it very, very positively. And that's what, again, makes me kind of think that it, it makes me think that it might be literally like a symbiotic relationship. And it makes me think because of our laws, because these mushrooms are illegal in all the states of the United States and essentially all throughout the world. It makes me wonder kind of like what parts of our human nature our original human nature are we really missing because we've made legislative laws which don't really understand the science of, of what's happening and they're kind of fear-based laws that then, that then basically essentially disenfranchise us from the natures that we used to have.
Okay. So humans, humans are one of like the most invasive species on the planet in the sense that humans have learned how to live everywhere. Humans have learned how to adapt and survive in every single environment. And any crop or plant or organism that learns to live with humans does very, very, very well on the planet Earth. So dogs. Dogs do very well. If you look at like the biomass of dogs, like how many dogs are there? The movie alters. How many dogs are there? Like dogs are a very, very successful species in terms of like their populations on the planet. And that's because they've learned how to coexist with humans. Dogs are domesticated. Dogs will not survive on their own. They literally are symbiotic with humans. And if you got rid of humans, dog, most of the dogs would essentially just die because they can't survive in the wild. Now, wheat. Wheat is the same way. So when humans 10,000 years ago learned to grow the wheat crop in the agricultural revolution, all of a sudden wheat spread throughout like the entire earth and was now cultivated and had basically essentially a massive boom of reproduction because it learned how to become symbiotic with humans. Cows, the same way. When we learned how to domesticate cattle, the cattle populations on the earth exploded because now humans were growing them for food. And that's why I'm saying there's an, actually an opening here since these mushrooms grow in cow shit. That's the opening through which they hitch a ride and learn how to be symbiotic with humans. Ergot. What's ergot? I've heard that word before, but it's not, it's not coming to my mind what that is. Okay. I'll just finish with saying this last thing. So I read a lot of philosophy from this guy named Nassim Taleb. I really like his books. And one of the things that he preaches, ooh, it's getting close to my face. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running out of material to smoke. <laughs> Fungus in the ride. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's where I had heard it. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the things that Nassim Taleb preaches, essentially, is that Humans are happiest when we're, when we're kind of doing things that bring us closer to what we were doing essentially 10,000 years ago. Because humans have evolved for hundreds of thousands of years into this way of life. And then that way of life dramatically changed 10,000 years ago when we learned to grow stuff in agriculture. Our complete, we used to be these hunter-gatherer societies that would essentially walk around and do things that hunter-gatherers would do, okay? And then as soon as we started to do agriculture 10,000 years ago, our entire Nassim Taleb, so it's N-A-S-E-E-M, and then Taleb, you spelled it correctly. He's on Twitter. He writes, He's the books he has are Skin in the Game, Fooled by Randomness, Anti-Fragile, The Black Swan, uh, and then he's got an aphorisms book. I've read them all. Antifragile is really, really, really good. Antifragile is a really, really good book. Um, but you kind of have to read The Black Swan first to kind of understand the premise of Antifragile. Uh, I should do, I'll, I'll eventually do a whole, I'll do a whole series on his, on his books because his books are so good. But one of his big premises is that humans are essentially happiest when we are living the way kind of like we lived 10,000 years ago. So if we kind of organize our life more like hunter-gatherers, we would actually live a lot better life. Because when we essentially became farmers, we essentially changed to this lifestyle where we now squat in a place and we eat one thing. Like we used to eat berries and nuts and deer and things we hunted and things we killed and mushrooms. And then when we became, when we became an agricultural society, like our diet entirely shifted to like wheat. We ate wheat. And like that, that kind of like it, what, what his books kind of talk about is how like there's actually like consequences to that in terms of like how we think and like it makes us probably like less happy. So anyway, to relate this back to mushrooms. Taleb kind of talks about how getting, again, getting in touch with things that are very, very ancient 
is usually a good way to like um, be happy. And so it makes me kind of wonder, like I've never had, I've never had these mushrooms, but it kind of makes me wonder like, what am I missing? Because I've never taken this very, very, very safe substance, which could, could potentially like expand my creativity like a thousand fold. And the only reason I cannot take it is because there's some arbitrary law written by some idiot who doesn't understand the science behind these mushrooms. It's just written by somebody who essentially like doesn't know anything about these mushrooms. So it does, it makes me wonder like, like what am I missing? So I'll, I'll end with that. Uh, any questions? This was kind of a long, kind of a fun one. But I've been reading these books about this. Like I said, I read half of Terrence McKenna's book. And this is also in the context of watch the Joe Rogan. Watch. Here's what you should do is watch the Joe Rogan po podcast with Paul Stamats. S-T-A-M-A-T-S. He's like mush he's the mushroom expert. He talks all about this. It's a really fascinating uh, podcast. Watch that one. Super interesting. All right, this is good. I like I like doing these at night. I think I'm gonna do these less often, but more in detail and at night. So I think what I'm gonna do with these videos is I'm gonna what I'm gonna try to do is collect really coherent thoughts throughout the week. And then try to do some very, very more serious, almost kind of like lectures on these topics. I kind of like that style. What I was doing before was I was trying to do put out a video every day. And that gets really, really tiring. And it also makes me, it also forces me to kind of say things that I haven't quite thought through completely. So I'm going to try to kind of slow down the pace a little bit, but try to do longer videos that I can more enjoy talking about. And slow down a little bit. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. All right, have a good night. End.